Hello. Welcome. My name is Dr. Moshe Appel. I'm a clinical psychologist and I have a group practice called ADO Psychology Center. ADO stands for Anxiety, Depression, OCD, which are the disorders that we specialize in. And I also post videos on these topics. So if you want to learn more, you can visit our website at ADO, A-D-O, psychologycenter.com. So the topic for tonight's talk is religious OCD. As many of you are already aware about OCD, and I also spoke about this a few weeks ago, OCD is a debilitating disorder. It stands for obsessive compulsive disorder, and it's characterized by obsessions and compulsions. And there are many different types of OCD. Last time we spoke about relationship OCD, but some common examples include contamination OCD, where people have thoughts about being sick or being contaminated, and they engage in compulsions like washing their hands or maybe checking the stove and they're afraid that their house might burn down and they check their stove a bunch. But tonight we're going to talk about religious OCD. Religious OCD is just another one of the flavors of OCD and it's OCD that are where the obsessions and compulsions are centered around religious beliefs and rituals. OCD often attacks people in the areas of their life that they really value. So, in, for example, postpartum OCD, a mother really values her kid, and she may start having OCD about that. OCD might be like thoughts, intrusive thoughts. What if I harm my kid? And, um, you know, other types of thoughts that might be around it. But it makes sense that religious people, given that they value their religion, if they have OCD, it would make sense that some of their OCD symptoms revolve around their religion. So it's important to clarify that religion does not cause OCD, but someone who has OCD and is religious will likely have some symptoms of religious OCD. So what is religious OCD? Let, let's start by just giving some examples. You know, a common example in religious OCD is excessive or repetitive prayer. So someone might be praying or davening for a very long period of time and or, you know, doing it repetitively. So repeating words, for example, or they may have thoughts of, am I having the full concentration that I'm supposed to be, you know, having during this prayer and, you know, uh, am I being distracted? Am I having intrusive images while I'm supposed to be engaging in this prayer? So it could be a lot of different thoughts or, you know, and compulsions around prayer. Some compulsions might be repeating davening a few times or um, maybe asking a rabbi if they should repeat the prayer. So that's like one common example. Another example can involve meat and dairy. So milchiks and fleshiks and like mixing meat and uh, dairy items, um, they may, you know, have this thought that if I have meat and dairy on my counter, even if they're very separate from each other, maybe somehow, you know, a drop from this pot went into a drop from that pot. And again, within religion, we have some serious questions related to these things. It's important to differentiate, and soon we will, between standard religious practice or even stringent religious practice versus OCD. That's another example where it can come up. Another one is repetitive and ritual hand washing, right? If you think about it, how many times are we washing our hands in a ritualistic way throughout the day? Like in the morning when we get up, before davening, before prayer, before we eat, after we eat, my machronim for those who do that. So there's a lot of hand washing. And of course, when it's within the religious rules and it's within what's expected, it's a beautiful thing. But it could turn into an OCD thing where someone's like washing their hands multiple times over again or like cleaning their hands ex excessively until they feel like they're fully clean and now they could do their ritualistic hand washing. Another example related can involve family purity and going to mikvah and preparing oneself before going to the mikvah. Again, that itself could be an, uh, a long process, which is within the religious values and beliefs and rituals and halacha. But in OCD, it could turn into this torturous hours and hours long process and asking a lot of questions and redoing things way too many times. Another example would be excessive use of the restroom, like before davening, is my body fully clean? Um, do I need to go to the bathroom again? Sometimes even in shul, you might see someone that's going in and out constantly the whole davening. And this is another area where it could really affect people as well. Other areas include taboo images. So having intrusive 
unwanted but like inappropriate images either during prayer or throughout the day and they say why am i having these images and i can't have them and that's terrible and i need to replace them with good images and again it could be another source of, of distress shabbos of course has so many laws and values so someone could check their pockets like a hundred times a day make sure they're not carrying as an example or as you can imagine many other areas um monetary laws so am i stealing Am I, you know, did I get the correct change from the store? Do I need to count over the change? Make sure that I'm not getting the wrong change. You know, did my landlord, when they raised the, the rent, mean to raise it this much? Or were they planning on raising it more? Do I need to go back and ask them? A lot of questions about monetary stuff can come up. And another common one is, am I a true believer? And many people sometimes struggle with the question of what do I believe and how much do I believe? Um, but an OCD could take on this this feeling of a never ending question. And that's something to keep in mind in OCD versus other, you know, regular doubts as an OCD, it's this excessive sticky nature that you can't get out of your head. And when you're not triggered in OCD, you kind of know like, no, I believe, I know I'm davening okay, but in the trigger of the OCD, it feels so scary and so, you know, you're really worried with the doubt. And again, soon I'm gonna talk more about um, how to differentiate. I know I got some questions here and we will address all of them um, at the end. So let's talk about now OCD versus standard religious practice. And I'm briefly gonna mention a research study that was done where they looked at Orthodox Jews versus non-Orthodox Jews in their ability to be able to identify religious OCD. And the hypothesis was that religious individuals, Orthodox individuals would be less likely to be able to identify religious OCD because they're gonna say that's just stringent religious practice. The person's being machmer, they're doing great. They're davening for a long period of time. What could be better? And the non-religious will say, no, that's OCD. But what they found was actually the opposite. The religious, the Orthodox Jews were able to identify it as OCD because they knew what religious practice really looked like and what OCD was, how, how it was like way too excessive. To the non-Orthodox Jews, Probably everything seemed to be like OCD and they, they knew that that was their religion. And so they didn't identify it as religious OCD and they didn't recommend treatment. And so the implications of the study is the importance for the therapist to be able to understand the patient's culture and be able to identify the nuances between religious practice and um, you know, religious OCD. So how do we differentiate? And so I'm gonna give you now a few tips, a few things to keep in mind or a few questions you can ask to see which one is it? Is it just standard religious practice or even stringent religious practice, which could be looked at as a good thing? Or is it religious OCD? One question you can ask is, you know, is this clearly excessive? When I'm looking around and I'm comparing this individual to the, their peers, to other people in the same religion, the, the, in the same culture, am I, does their behavior or their questions or their doubts seem way too excessive? So that's one indicator of it maybe being religious OCD. Another question you can ask is, are there a lot of doubts? Are there a lot of what ifs and maybes? Usually in religious, in stringent religious practice, someone is not doubting, they know where their values are, they know where they wanna devote their time and energy to, and they're doing it full force. But in religious OCD, there's a lot of doubting and asking, what if this, what if that, maybe this, maybe that. What if I said the wrong thing in my prayer and I need to start over again? What if, I had an image and I don't even remember if I had an inappropriate image, but what if maybe I did have an inappropriate and does that somehow spoil my prayer? Or we pick a different religious example maybe. What if I washed my hands or I went to the mikvah, but I wasn't fully clean ahead of time and I need to clean. I have no reason to think that, but what if, or may maybe. If there are a lot of what ifs or maybes, that's a telltale sign of religious OCD. Another question you could ask is, is this person's behavior stemming from distress or devotion? Usually in stringent religious practice, it's from devotion. Someone really is devoted to their religion, devoted to God, devoted to the mitzvahs, and so they're really putting their heart into it and they're spending a lot of time, money, and energy, and it's an enjoyable endeavor. However, sometimes it's out of distress. It's not that they're trying to become closer, but it's like, I'm so worried that maybe I did X, Y, Z and I have to redo it. I'm so worried that you know I did something bad in the past and now I have to like, fix that. If it's coming from a lot of distress and all of their religious practice seems to be stemming from distress versus devotion, that's another great question you, you can ask to try to differentiate. Another question you can ask is, is this negatively impacting other areas of their Jewish life? So is their 
need to spend so much time in the bathroom through our prayer, like not allowing them to pray normally? Or is their need to spend so much time with prayer that they're not able now to, you know, spend time like learning or doing something else that maybe is a religious value of theirs. So if their own religion is interfering with religion, that again tells you that maybe this isn't all about religion and it's more about OCD. Another question you can ask is, are they only being stringent for certain religious laws? Someone who's generally, you know, uh, Orthodox, ultra-Orthodox Jew or someone who's machmer is usually like that in many areas of their religious life. If, it, if it's only within one specific area, like only in monetary laws, or only when it comes to prayer, that again smells a little bit like OCD and not just stringent religious practice. Another question you can ask is, if a rabbi told this person to do otherwise, or not only a rabbi, what if this person's rabbi told someone to do something a different way? So you know what? You should only go to the bathroom one time before prayer, for example, right? Um, can this person follow the rules? So mo most people in Orthodox Judaism, they have a rabbi, and whatever the rabbi says goes, and they're okay with that. But in, in OCD, usually the person will say, but what if the rabbi doesn't really understand my situation and therefore he's telling me to do X, Y, Z? Or what if this rabbi is saying, but maybe there are other rabbis who say differently and I need to follow them. So if the person has trouble following what the rabbi is telling them to do, that again is a sign that maybe it's the OCD and not just the religion that's causing their behavior. And then last question is, is there a lot of uh, reassurance seeking? In OCD in general, people often are trying to get reassurance. They're trying to be told like, what you're doing is okay and don't worry about it. And so if they're constantly asking for reassurance, they constantly go to the rabbi and say, when I did this, was it okay? You know, uh, I did X, Y, and Z, is that okay? I know last week you told me it's okay, but this week's a little bit different. Are you sure it's okay? If they're asking for a lot of reassurance like that, that again is a telltale sign that it might be religious OCD. So again, I'm not saying you should diagnose people based off of these questions, but if you are a therapist and you wanna have some questions to ask, or if you're a patient or someone who's suffering from OCD and you wanna figure it out, is this religious OCD or not, these questions can definitely help you get somewhere closer to, to what's actually going on. So what does treatment look like? Treatment in general for OCD, what's considered the gold standard treatment nowadays is ERP, exposure and response prevention. And exposure and response prevention is pretty much where people are told to stop engaging in their compulsions, and that's the response prevention piece, and to actually expose themselves to some of their triggers. So for example, we'll tell someone, stop cleaning the outside of the pot every day or every few hours to make sure that there's no milk and meat mixing in some magical way, right? That'll be the response prevention. And the exposure might be, go ahead and put the dairy pot and the meat pot on the same shelf in the fridge, right? Something that this person would never do before because they're so afraid that they may touch and, the, the, and it may become religiously contaminated. Another example might be the person says, I don't know if, I can, if I'm concentrating well enough. And so throughout prayer, I'm constantly checking in with myself to see, am I concentrating enough? So response prevention would be, stop that. Stop checking in with yourself if you're concentrating enough. Just do the prayer and get out. But the exposure might be purposely pray in a place where it's very busy or a lot's going on or sit in a place in the shul in the synagogue with it's a lot of distractions. So again, you wanna expose the person, you wanna expose yourself to the trigger and not engage in your compulsions. And just one more example, maybe someone has this constant thought, what if I don't believe? What if I'm not a true believer? I don't know. And if that's the thought, then again, exposure would be purposely think a few times throughout the day that you know what, maybe you don't fully believe. And what does that feel like? Now, some of these uh, exposures, someone who's not familiar with OCD, might sound uh, inappropriate in some way for a uh, religious person, but that's why it's important to always consult with a rabbi, ideally with the person's rabbi. And so you wanna, before you're engaging or setting these exposures, you wanna make sure with the rabbi that it's still in line with the religious values and that it's okay to engage in the exposure before you're doing it. But overall, that's what the general treatment might look like. So what are some, obstacles that might come up specifically in religious OCD treatment. And there are a bunch um, because OCD, yes, you know, it could come many flavors and religious OCD is just another one of those flavors, but it does have its nuances. So one issue might come up with differentiating OCD symptoms versus standard religious practice. And for someone who's not aware of their religion, they may say like, what, you're washing your hands three times in the morning every day and back and forth and back and forth. That sounds like OCD, but of course it's not. It's part of the religious practice. And so that's one obstacle that can come up. And usually the best way to get around this obstacle is if you're aware of the religion, 
then you can get better at it. Or if you ask the questions I mentioned before to differentiate whether this is standard religious practice or if it's religious OCD. Like, are you doing it out of distress or devotion? Is it clearly excessive? Are you doing it similar to other people? Are you doing it in a more of excessive way than other people? Like the questions I mentioned before. Another obstacle that can come up is that sometimes there's poor insight amongst people with religious OCD. So what is insight? When it comes to OCD, one of the specifiers is how insightful is this person? Meaning if they have good insight, they recognize that what they're experiencing is OCD. If they have poor insight, then they don't really recognize OCD. They say, you know what? Maybe this is really how I should be behaving. This is how I should be thinking. And other people should be doing more like me. So in religious OCD, sometimes we find that there's poor insight, which means the person says, I don't even know if this is OCD. Maybe I'm just, you know, being a really good Jew and I'm really trying hard. And so I need to be repeating my prayer and making sure I'm being, you know, have full concentration in prayer. And I need to keep the meat and milk completely separate and I need to keep cleaning the pots. And so there's poor insight. You can imagine that there's less motivation for treatment. And even if the person is suffering, they feel like there's no way out. And so the one, a good way to deal with this obstacle is by bringing attention to the to, to the person, how their OCD behavior is actually interfering with their religious values. If they're saying this is all religious, say, okay, but are you able to go to shul for davening or because there's too much distraction there from now on, you're just davening at home, you know? And if you show more and more how their religious, how their OCD really, their behaviors are interfering with their religion, that can motivate and improve insight to recognize this is OCD. Another obstacle that might come up is you want to make sure that your exposures are not violating actual Jewish law or they're not violating the person's actual values. So for example, if you tell them purposely think of an inappropriate thought, right? That might be violating their religious values. And so you want to consult with a rabbi, preferably that person's rabbi, in order to get the okay. But there's an issue with that as well, which is what if that rabbi isn't really so familiar with OCD and they say, what? Milk and meat on the same refrigerator shelf? Why would you tell them to do that? Like if they have a lot of space in their fridge, Great, let them keep it on separate shelves, keep it separate, that's even better. So you wanna get around this obstacle by finding a new rabbi. Now, you wanna, you know, hopefully provide psychoeducation, explain what OCD is, and most rabbis are already aware, or if not, they'll pick it up very quickly. Um, and sometimes if they really don't get it, it actually could be an issue. But usually through some psychoeducation, and speaking with the rabbi, they can understand what's going on um, much better. Another obstacle that might come up is uh, patients reassurance seeking from rabbis, especially in Orthodox Judaism, we're encouraged to ask questions and to ask the rabbi if things are okay and how to do things. And so in OCD, as you can imagine, this can become an issue on its own where the person's constantly going to the rabbi way, way too much. And so a way to get around this issue is number one, to implement rules between the person and the rabbi, which is when they're allowed to reach out and how frequently and what types of questions versus what type of questions not. And also to have pre-negotiated responses so that the rabbi can say, you know I can't answer that question, right? And that might be the pre-negotiated response so that the rabbi is not actually providing reassurance to the person and saying, oh, it's okay, it's okay, because that's ultimately not good for the treatment. But the person isn't feeling hurt or invalidated by the rabbi. So you want to have a pre-negotiated response where the person and rabbi have this deal that if you ask me any OCD questions, I'm not going to answer them. And the person's happy with that because they want to get better and they want to stay true to the treatment. Another obstacle that might come up is that, you know, we mentioned before when you're... When you're constructing exposures, you want to get the rabbi to say like, yeah, this is an okay exposure. The issue with that is once the rabbi says this exposure is okay, religiously okay, that itself can take all the steam out of the exposure because now the person is not concerned anymore because it's just okay. So you're not exposing them to their fear and letting them tolerate it and get used to it. So in a way, the rabbi giving their okay can actually decrease the effectiveness of the exposure. And so one way around this is to have an agreement that you're not going to tell the patient every time you're consulting with a rabbi. And so you're not going to say, I asked the rabbi this thing and he said it's okay, but rather you and the rabbi will be in touch and you and the rabbi will figure out what, you know, exposures are okay, what not okay. So there's some ambiguity there. And that's how you can still keep, you know, the exposure for, you know, to be effective and to be triggering to some extent, which is what we need in the treatment. So, let me just give two very brief Jewish sources 
you know, that sometimes people find very helpful when they're dealing with OCD. One of them is, The Torah was not given to angels. This is from Gemara Brachas, from the Talmud. And the idea is we're not meant to be perfect. We're not meant to do things a thousand times to make sure it's perfect. We're human beings. We're expected to behave as human beings. Another one is, Which is from Mishle, from Proverbs. Her ways are pleasant and all her ways are shalom. And again, the idea is that the, the Torah is meant to be, Judaism in general, religions in general, are meant to be, pleasant and peaceful, and if it's causing so much distress, something might be up, and it might be worth consulting with a rabbi, consulting with a therapist. I'm going to say uh, a very brief story that I heard from Rabbi Avi Wiesenthal, which really brings this point home, which is there was this kid who was greeting his grandfather who came from a long trip, and the grandfather comes out, and the grandfather asks the kid, his, you know, uh, his grandkid, can you please get my luggage from the back train of the car? So the kid goes all the way to the back train, and he starts taking the luggage, and the, the grandfather sees the kid from far, schlepping, like really dragging this luggage. And he's like, no, 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 it's the wrong one. It's the wrong one. The kid's not understanding. The kid keeps coming, keeps schlepping, schlepping, dragging, dragging. Finally, the kid comes to the grandfather. The grandfather's saying, I was telling you the whole time, you got the wrong luggage. The kid said, but how do you know? I was so far away, you didn't even see which luggage I got. How'd you know it was the wrong luggage? And the grandfather said, because my luggage was very light. And when I saw you schlepping it and dragging it and struggling with it, I knew it was the wrong piece of luggage. And that's something to keep in mind when it comes to Judaism. It's not meant to be this terrible strain that you're dragging and struggling. If you do feel like that, it might be the wrong Judaism. It might be more religious OCD, not the actual religion. But again, sometimes religion could be stringent and could be hard and straining. It doesn't mean you give it up. So it's always good if you're feeling that way to consult with a rabbi, consult with a therapist. So just to summarize, we spoke about how OCD in general comes in many different colors. Religious OCD is just one of these colors, but there are some nuances within religious OCD that's worth being aware about. You want to be able to differentiate religious OCD from standard or stringent religious practice. We spoke about religion doesn't cause OCD, but if you are religious and you have OCD, you're likely going to have these types of symptoms. We spoke about the treatment for OCD, exposure and response prevention, the importance of collaborating with a rabbi, and we spoke about how... Um, you know, when it comes to collaborating with the rabbi, there are some nuances with how to do it to make sure that you're keeping the exposure still very effective. So let me see if I can answer any of your questions. Oh, you can also submit questions to me through my website, which is adopsychologycenter.com. That's adopsychologycenter.com. And I also post other videos there, which you can watch as well. But let me uh, quickly scroll up here and see if I can answer any questions before we end for tonight. One question here was, can this please be recorded? The answer is yes, it will be. It will be posted on my website, also on OK Clarity's Instagram. Um, can someone show OCD symptoms only to religion? Yes. So when it comes to OCD, there are different subtypes. Some people experience a few different subtypes, but some people only experience one subtype. And so someone definitely can experience just religious OCD, and it's still it's a full-blown case of OCD. Absolutely. Um, how do you differentiate OCD versus healthy worry that is dangerous? I think we addressed that a little bit. How to differentiate OCD versus a more typical type of worry someone might have within their religion. If it's not so excessive, it's not constantly doubting, maybe and what ifs, and that sort of thing. But sometimes it is more nuanced. And in those cases, I recommend speaking with a rabbi and a therapist to try to figure that out. Um, how do you help a family member with religious OCD? It's hard to help people if they are very low on insight, like I mentioned before. But if you could increase their insight, it might be easier to help them. So maybe if you have a close relationship and you're doing it from a loving place, obviously, and you say, I care about you and I love you, and it seems like this might be religious OCD, where you know if you're, if you're happy with the way it is, then great, there's no issue. But if you feel like you're struggling, maybe it's worth you know, speaking to Robert or a therapist and figuring that, that piece of it out. But, but it may not be religious OCD. So we don't want to label everything as religious OCD just because it seems like someone is acting more stringently than we are, you know, for example. So it could be, it doesn't have to be, but that's where a therapist and a rabbi can figure it out. A therapist, you know, ideally someone who specializes in religious OCD because it is more of a nuanced case. And so I think it's uh, this specific subtype definitely is helpful when the person has experience with this specific subtype. Where does religious OCD come from? Our sages didn't have these issues. First of all, who says... Some of them didn't, but we don't know, but okay. Uh, why us, why this generation see so many cases? So it's a good question in general. Has mental health deteriorated? And in some ways it has been. W one explanation is that back in the day, people were so needing to deal with just survival that there wasn't any room for what ifs and maybes. It was like, I have to make sure bread's on the table tomorrow. So I got to work hard all day. And there was no space even for other doubts to come in. Another hypothesis might be that nowadays we're able to control everything so much in our lives, right? Like we have umbrellas, we have cars, we have, you know, 
we can control almost every aspect of our life. We have predictions and weather reports and all that type of stuff. So this idea of being able to tolerate uncertainty, which is actually one of the core underlying, you know, faulty thinking patterns in OCD, is this intolerance for uncertainty. And if you can't tolerate uncertainty, you know, that could breed some OCD and anxiety. So that could be another answer. But it's, it's a good question. There are many different answers. There's no concrete answer. I think that's all for tonight for questions. Thank you all for joining. And again, if you have any other questions, you can submit them to my website, adopsychologycenter.com. Have a great night, everyone.